Good morning, everyone, and welcome to EAB University's 2018 Spring Webinar Series, which is funded by the USDA Forest Service. This is Robin Usborne, and along with my EAB University colleagues, Cliff Sadoff and Elizabeth Barnes from Purdue University, and Amy Stone from Ohio State University, we welcome you to today's webinar on bringing urban forestry full circle wood utilization post emerald ash borer, which is being presented by Jessica Simons. Jessica is the owner of Verdant Stewardship, a consultancy with expertise in urban wood use and other natural resources management issues. She coordinates the Michigan Urban Wood Network and the National Firewood Scout Program on behalf of the Sustainable Resources Alliance and provides ongoing support for Recycle Ann Arbor's Urban Wood Project. Before we get started today, please know that we welcome your comments and questions, so please feel free to type them in the chat feature, which you can find by mousing over the bottom or occasionally the top of your screen. We will be making notes of all the questions and we'll have Jessica respond to them when, when her presentation is finished. To keep these free webinars coming, we need your feedback. After the webinar, you will be mailed a link to a short, voluntary, confidential survey that I hope you'll take the time to fill out. If you're one of the first 10 people to fill the survey, we will be sending you an EAB goodie bag. And even if you maybe you've already received a goodie bag, we hope you'll, you'll do the survey anyway. For those of you wanting CEUs, if you would like a certificate indicating that you participated in today's live webinar, please complete the survey and send an email message to Amy Stone at stone.91 at osu.edu. You will all receive, also receive instructions in the email that I'll be sending out later about that. Certificates will be mailed to you within a week of today's program. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing soon at www.emeraldashboard.info. You will also find the recordings for all previous EAB University webinars there. Thank you for attending today. And Jessica, now you can start your presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Robin. It's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to be part of EAB University again. It's, it's been a long time. Um, when Robin first approached me about this, I said, well, you know, honestly, we, we don't do a whole lot with ash anymore because, well, we, we got our start in Southeast Michigan where um, EAB hit hardest and earliest. And so there's not so much ash, but I think we still have a really interesting story to tell about what can happen following the days of EAB and um, where some surprising benefits can really arise if you're willing to, to look at, um, at the problems as an opportunity and a challenge to be solved. So today I'm going to be talking all about what we do with the wood after something like emerald ash borer and some of the surprising industries that can be jump-started um, if we actually look at this wood as a resource to be used. So first off, um, I'm going to get a little into storytelling here and I would really encourage all of you, this works much better in a crowded room where I can see some faces, but for webinar purposes we're still going to have to imagine a little bit. I want all of you listening to think about your favorite tree. Um, the, the picture that we, we have here, the, the large tree that you see on the left is literally my favorite tree. This is my parents' backyard in Pennsylvania. That is the tree where my dad put um, a little platform up in there so I could hide up there and read as a kid. And you know, this is a tree that has a tremendous amount of sentimental value to me. And to be honest, I would be devastated if I got a call from my mom and dad and they said that there was something wrong and this tree had to come down. So I want you all, as you think about, I know that many of the people on this webinar are the kind of folks who are looking at the big picture of, of things like invasive species outbreaks and how to handle large scale management plans, whether that's on a community level or whether that's on a state level. But I also want you to really think about the personal impacts of of a crisis like Emerald Ash Borer or whatever the, you know, the latest uh, forest health disaster is. And to realize that um, while, while we have tremendous problems looking at the magnitude of thousands, millions of trees dying, um, fundamentally, 
if we want to connect with people, we also have to understand that that the one-on-one -on -one value, a single favorite tree, is where it really hits people the hardest and where you have an opportunity to really reach them with the story of what's happening and to provide new alternatives. So again, I have my, now I have more of my favorite trees. I'm getting really personal here. This is my backyard right now. These are the oak trees that um, are just off of my backyard deck. This is where we hang our hammock. This is where my kids play under them. And what we have found in trying to develop urban wood use programs following EAB is that people love the story. People already have very deep, very long lasting stories about the trees that make up their landscapes. And what Urban Wood does is it gives people an opportunity to continue that story. The story of those trees does not have to end. And in fact, it can just live on as something different. And that's really where the rest of my presentation goes because this is our alternative. You know, most of the story that we've been told is when a, when a situation like Emerald Ash Borer arises, you end up with tremendous tree mortality and then you end up with loss. And the story just ends at loss when all of the, when a tree removal, um, uh, prior, when tree removal priorities come into a particular park or into a particular street, you have dead trees, you have open landscapes and all that wood just disappears. And people are left with only the memory of what that space once looked like and felt like to them. When you have something like EAB, it becomes huge and it, this is where you know i wish i had the um the voiceover of the you know the apocalyptic movie trailer um but you know that that's really how it feels to people and so we looked at the urban wood crisis instead as an opportunity how could we take the resource from all of the trees being removed and actually turn this to something that becomes value to people to communities to our economy so it becomes an opportunity for, um, for good stewardship of our resources in terms of, of making better actual use of the wood that's being removed. But it also really can add a lot to um, our, our, our social impacts of a crisis like EAB and giving people some comfort that we really can do something else. So these programs started um, through the work of the Southeast Michigan Resource Conservation and Development Council, a nonprofit based in Ann Arbor. Um, we started looking at urban wood as an opportunity um, back very early days of the EAB outbreak in Michigan. So our programming started off in 2004 through um, a lot of generous funding from the USDA Forest Service. And in that work in the early days, we really were trying to figure out well, all, all sides of this story. Is there really value in the urban forest? Is there actually any, um, is, is there any real log resource that we could tap into? Um, and how is that something we can communicate to industry? So early on, um, we, with the help of some wonderful researchers at MSU um, and beyond, we did some surveys looking at the the actual urban resource in southeast Michigan and found that the dead and dying trees in that region could produce over 70 million board feet of lumber each year. So this is just in urban and suburban landscapes. These are things like streets, backyards, parks, all of the areas where you do not typically have timber harvests taking place. And what was interesting that they found in this this survey is that while EAB definitely put a blip in that mortality and boosted it up, there is a tremendous amount of background mortality that's happening just generally in urban forests of Southeast Michigan. And then a secondary survey that, um, that took place actually had um, questionnaires that went out to members of industry trying to find out, well, if they're removing trees, what are they doing with all of the wood that's wasted? in Southeast Michigan. And they found that companies were paying almost $9 million a year to dispose of wood. So just to throw away wood resources was a tremendous economic burden on, on those industries in the region. And that didn't even get into what municipal costs were. So this was just a survey to private industry. And what we found in the survey was that almost a third of the wood that came out of Southeast Michigan's communities was sent to landfills. And so right off the bat, we're saying, okay, wood disposal is expensive and there aren't a whole lot of alternatives for it right now. 
a follow-up study that was done by Michigan State University then in 2009 actually looked at every wood disposal yard they could find in the region. And so it wasn't, um, they weren't looking at landfills at this point, they were looking at the kind of yards that are set up either very formally um, on a large scale or even on a smaller scale by businesses that were willing to accept wood waste and collect it in some way. And they, they identified 180 wood disposal yards throughout a 14 county region of Southeast Michigan and found that those yards generated $40 million a year to the local economy, but that only about a third of the wood that entered those yards was turned into any other kind of product. So only about a third of the wood even became mulch or firewood um, or fuel, the most, common, um, the most common lower value products. A lot of the wood enters those yards and just sits there. So altogether, when we look at all of those pieces together, we see that there really is a huge amount of resource that is not being tapped into in Michigan. Now, before I go any further, most of the rest of my presentation is really going to talk about urban lumber and the opportunities for using wood at kind of higher value, um, as higher value products. And so I want to just put up, up front, there is nothing wrong with firewood or mulch for urban trees. Nothing at all wrong with those. And in fact, those are very important markets for urban wood. And um, the vast majority of wood from urban areas that is turned into any kind of other product goes to firewood, mulch, or fuel. And that's great. And I'm, I, we, we've been really pleased to see that we have fairly robust markets for those things. The argument that I will make and that all of my colleagues in the urban wood world make is that we advocate for the highest and best use of the wood that is practically feasible. And so what we've seen, there are many cases for a community or, um, or for a tree care company where turning urban, removed urban trees into firewood or mulch is the best option they've got. They have a thriving market for it. They can do it at no cost. Um, they have arrangements with other businesses that are willing to accept the material. And if that's the case, that's, that, that's fantastic. And we're not, we're, we're, we're not arguing against that. What we are discovering, though, is that there really are opportunities to salvage higher value logs and to move those into higher value products that can create new business opportunities. And so that's what I'll focus primarily on. But I'm going to put one pitch out for firewood right now. And then we'll, before we transition to the other the other stuff. I also manage a project called Firewood Scout. And if you're not familiar with that, it's an online directory of firewood producers. As we all know, anybody who is working in invasive species in any way, limiting firewood movement is one of the absolute most important things we can do to limit the pathways for transportation of invasive pests. And so what Firewood Scout does is it simply just maps out where firewood producers are all over partnering states, puts those on a map-based directory that's available online, and that way consumers can no longer have the excuse of, well, I don't know where firewood might be for sale where I'm going. So this gives them a chance where they can look it up in advance, they can find their firewood producers, they can find all the contact information. At the moment, we're working on a state-by-state -state basis on this. So we are working with a lead coordinator in each partnering state who is tasked with um, uh, building the directory and um, compiling the surveys of where the businesses are and verifying those. But if you are part of a state that is not currently one of the deep green states on here, get in touch. We'd love to expand the effort. We have 10 states represented on Firewood Scout right now. We think it's a really important program and is a great way to, um, to, to not only improve the visibility of small businesses in your state, but it's also a very important way to encourage people to buy wood where they're going to burn it. So anyway, there's my pitch for Firewood Scout. Get in touch. But in getting back to urban wood and the higher value uses, what we really found is that um, using urban wood as lumber um, that can be turned into flooring or furniture or any number of products really is a great form of recycling. And we found that it has a lot more to do with recycling than it does with logging, um, which you know a lot of people don't quite understand at first. But what we've realized is that urban wood is a resource that has been undervalued, but has been produced heavily by urban communities 
for decades. And this is a material that people traditionally think of waste and that we really have had a challenge in figuring out how to collect it, how to sort it out so we have that most high, um, the most high value material possible and to move that into industry. And that is something that sounds an awful lot more like recycling. And we really discovered the connection with recycling back in 2006 when we started having some conversations with Recycle Ann Arbor. Recycle Ann Arbor is a nonprofit based in Ann Arbor that handles the city's recycling programs. And when they heard about urban wood, it was an immediate connection where this made sense to them and this is something that they wanted to support. And so back in 2006, they agreed to work with, um, I think just one small local sawmill to try selling a little bit of urban lumber in their um, in the Recycle Ann Arbor Reuse Center, which is similar to a Habitat for Humanity Restore, if you're familiar with those. So this is a terrible picture. Um, <laughs> this was one. This is the only picture I have from that era, and it's a good example of how sometimes when things start, you don't realize um, you don't realize how pivotal it's going to be till many years down the road. So we don't have great photo documentation of the earliest days, but this early effort of trying to, to put um, a lot of ash, um, but uh, other species of urban lumber recovered from Southeast Michigan's communities into Recycle Ann Arbor. Um, this first happened in, in 06. It is now a pivotal part of their reuse center. So you can see the urban wood marketplace there is now something that they're heavily marketing. It's something that really sets their business aside from, um, from other thrift operations in the area. And what we've essentially created is a farmer's market, but for local wood. And so um, their center was recently renamed the Burge Urban Wood Center as of last year, but it's been around for over a decade already. And as you can see, it has really turned into a thriving marketplace. We have six different small producers that are all salvaging logs from urban tree care operations and recovering that material into lumber that is then sold to the public. And um, we've gotten a ton of interest from homeowners, from architects, from woodworkers, just people who have a lot of different interests in wood, but who love the story of how we can take trees that have to come down for other reasons and turn them into a sustainable product, a sustainable local product that can continue to provide beauty in their homes. So I'll just um, briefly blast through some of the photos here. So one of the things we found is that it doesn't have to look like a traditional lumber yard in order to sell urban lumber. So we do have beautiful clear walnut boards and um, you know, some things that most people would recognize as high value material. But we also have some unusual things. And so um, arguably some of the wood, uh, smaller wood pieces that you see here, most people would think of as firewood. Um, but what we have found is that there are many local woodworkers that are in, really interested in unusual pieces of wood that they can't find elsewhere. And so that's what the urban wood marketplace really tries to strive to offer. Um, everything from small, um, small turning blocks and uh, turning rounds for wood turners to just small cross cut sections that can be used as plaques or um, centerpieces. Um, we have a lot of people who buy them up in quantities for you know, wedding table um, centerpieces, that sort of thing. But the thing that's been really surprising is a lot of wood that would have no value in traditional commodity lumber markets ends up having an incredible amount of value if you offer it to the right group of customers. So people who are looking for artistic starting place, people who want something unusual to turn it into um, uh, a real, um, something that's very eye-catching and unique, there's a lot of opportunity for it. And so we have purposefully stayed away from traditional lumber grades because that's not the business that we're in. We are simply taking the wood that has become available from our communities and put that out uh, for the public as an offering. Um, over the years, we've tried a few experiments where we found that there are a lot of folks who are interested in woodworking but may not have the traditional skills who um, want to take a stab at DIY projects. And so we even offer things like small cuts of, of lumber that are already shelf sized, sold right next to shelf brackets um, in order to appeal to customers who 
maybe only have a drill and want to hang something. <laughs> Uh, recently, some of our producers have, have started doing a little bit more finished pieces, so things like um, shelf uh, corbels and even Adirondack tier kits are something that we've started offering as of late. But again, this is all from trees that would have been considered as waste. Without a doubt, some of our most popular items have been the slabs. And so um, if, you've, you know, if you've looked in any home design um, outlets, large live edge material is really hot right now. And so the fact that um, people can go in and literally find a slab of a dead ash tree that, um, that, that, that just perished on a Southeast Michigan street and turn that right into a table is pretty phenomenal. There's one of our partners with, uh, uh, with one of those slabs. But so we've been continuing to, to kind of tweak this marketplace idea. Um, it's, it's taken shape in a lot of different ways. We've, <laughs> we joke that we keep it as informal as possible and only change stuff when things are broken. And so um, we've just added on little by little over the years, finding that we could keep making space because customers just keep coming and they continue to be interested in the material. And so we, we're working on it slowly but surely. It's been a real grassroots effort, but it has proved to be very popular um, with the local community. And so a couple of years ago, we wanted to get a better handle on what customers were really interested in when it comes to, uh, when it comes to urban lumber. And we found that the vast majority of people who were coming into the urban wood marketplace in Ann Arbor are interested in woodworking or artistic pieces. So the pie, um, the pie graph you see on the left there, all of the green are, are from woodworkers and artists who are coming in looking for starting material. But we do have a fair number of people who are making products for sale, um, people who are doing home repairs. And so, you know, there's, um, there's a little variety in the customers, but most are woodworkers at heart. But the interesting thing for anyone who's been told that urban trees don't have any value as lumber because they're too damaged, because there's metal in them, because they don't have the form that, um, that traditional, traditionally harvested wood from timber stands have. It, it's not true. <laughs> what we found is that the variety is what the customers are interested in. So we tried to, to ask about pretty much every different um, characteristic of lumber that we thought people might be interested in or might, um, might not be interested in to see you know, who wanted what. And what we found was there was basically a customer who wanted anything. So there were some customers looking for kiln dried material, but there were, there were just as many customers looking for air dried material. There are people looking for perfectly clear wood like you would find at a traditional lumber yard, but, the, but nearly twice as many were looking for highly figured wood that doesn't fit traditional lumber characteristics. A huge proportion were looking for live edged material. And so really it's the variety that is of interest to people. And I'm confident that the story is also a huge motivating factor. And so the very things that make urban lumber different are also the very things that make urban lumber so appealing to customers. And we've seen a huge amount of growth. And so, so far I've mostly talked about the Recycle Ann Arbor urban wood marketplace, we have seen um, a, a great experience in Flint as well. And so we have partnered with the Habitat for Humanity Restore in Flint, and they started their own marketplace about five years ago. It's not as large as the one at Recycle Ann Arbor, and um, it hasn't been quite as heavily marketed, but we've seen steady growth there as well. But I also can't emphasize enough with the growth of this marketplace, um, my background's in forestry, and and I, I'm the one who provides kind of coordination and marketing assistance for the Urban Wood Project. And I do it very part-time, um, on the side, so very little, and with no marketing expertise. So I, like, I try to be very humble about that. But I, I always feel like it would be interesting to see what would happen if we had somebody with you know, true marketing chops pushing this. But so what you really see in this graph is organic growth. This is what happens when customers hear about a product that they're interested in by word of mouth and keep coming in to buy it. And that's what we've really seen over the last decade of trying to sell urban lumber. 
um, following the EAB outbreak. And what has been really exciting in Michigan is that we're not the only ones. So there are a lot of businesses that have now cropped up in the last 10 years looking at this model, looking at how we can take a resource that's been largely treated as waste and turn it into something that the public wants. And um, we've seen a lot of success over this. And so I, there, here are a few businesses that, um, that are operating in the state that are doing some beautiful things. There are many more out there. This is just a small sampling. Um, one that I do love to highlight is a company called Urban Ashes that's based out of Celine. And they are doing mostly picture frames, but some home furnishings as well, all from either urban trees, like what we've been talking about, or from deconstruction wood from homes that have been um, demolished in the city of Detroit. And they are, they're even taking the sustainability and social good part of the business one step further. Um, their whole workforce is made up of people who are transitioning out of the corrections programs in the state. And so it is really a job and like life skills development company as well. And so they are, they're really doing some beautiful, beautiful work. There's a great program that has started up at Michigan State University. Their Shadows program is salvaging trees from campus tree removals, turning those into products that they're marketing to alumni and to the wider community. And so everything from beautiful furnishings like you see here to diploma frames um, to um, they do a lot of you know plaques with uh, university buildings engraved on them or um, office supplies, things like business card holders and pens. And so it's a beautiful way for them to commemorate campus trees, but also create, um, create a, a great learning opportunity for students because they are actually part of the whole project. They do um, all of the preliminary work right on campus. So the harvesting is, is in partnership with the campus grounds program. Then it goes to the Department of Forestry where the wood is milled and kiln dried. And then they work with a whole network of producers um, that are small businesses within the state of Michigan to do the finishing work on them. So um, that's a great partnership. They have a, they have a nice website where you can actually see the products directly and order things um, right from the program if you're interested. The Ann Arbor Traverwood Library, I think, is a beautiful example of how, how trees from something like EAB can have of real lasting beauty. Um, this, this library has actually been around over a decade already, but when the building was being constructed in 2006, there was a, um, they just had acres of dead ash trees on the site where the building was going up. And so rather than do a typical land clearing, they harvested ash trees from the building site and put those back into the building as flooring and paneling and even structural beams. And this, um, uh, this example gained so much recognition. Um, there was a beautiful documentary put together about the building's construction that was even showcased at the U.S. Green Building Council's um, film festival. So this, is, this has gotten national recognition. The Ann Arbor um, Reuse Center also has been starting to host a woodworker showcase. And so this is just a, a smattering of entries from last year's um, exhibit. And so there are just so many people who are excited about how we can find other beautiful, very high-end uses for trees coming out of our communities. And I think that their work is really inspiring. So for the whole tail end of my presentation, I really want to talk about an effort that Michigan is a part of. Um, this is the Bringing Urban Forestry Full Circle Grant that is funded by the USDA Forest Service. And it's an initiative between Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, and Missouri that are where we're all coming together um, as a, a Midwest push trying to bring this idea of using urban wood um, a little more into the forefront. And so we've had a lot of great projects happening across all four states over the last four years. We are now in the tail end of this grant period and we're, we're continuing it through uh, most of 2018. And I just wanna give you a few highlights of what we've been trying to do as part of this grant project. Um, one of the things that we did in Michigan just last year was a harvesting demonstration with the city um, in the city of Grand Rapids with the Land Conservancy of West Michigan and with Spalted Banjo Consulting. This was a neat project because land conservancies um, do a lot of tree removals as part of their restoration activities. And 
it ends up being a very expensive proposition for them most of the time. And there are many times where restoration activities are held up because they simply can't afford to do all of the tree removals that need to take place um, in, the, in the push to, for instance, trying to turn um, areas back into oak savannas, which was the case for one of the, the sites that we worked with them on. But so we did a harvesting demonstration with them on two different locations last year. One was a, um, a, pine, um, a pine area that they're trying to restore to oak. And then the other was a donated golf course that had dead um, EAB affected ash that were hazardous that they're, they're trying to remove. And so by Working with the project with utilization in mind, they were actually able to partner with sawmills that were interested in the material, which helped defray the cost of the tree removals that needed to take place. And so Spalted Banjo Consulting did all of the negotiations of setting up the partnerships, and the Land Conservancy was able to remove trees on both of these locations and see the wood turned into products, which really boosted the overall sustainability of the effort while, while reducing tree removal costs. So it was, it was a really successful program. We're excited for um, the kind of partnerships that that was able to develop for the Land Conservancy, and we hope that that really sets the stage for how they can manage those kind of projects moving forward. There were a couple of videos those that were made um, throughout that effort, and you can see those at miurbanwoodnetwork.com slash more. And they're both short. Um, each one's only a few minutes long, but they, they really tell the story of how these traditional forestry techniques can provide real benefits even in urban areas. We are working on developing a wood use plan right now with the city of Ann Arbor that we're pretty excited about. Um, this will be the first time that the city's management is directly partnering with sawmills, trying to find out how we can find higher value uses for, um, for the trees that are coming out um, of the regular ongoing city tree maintenance. And um, this is pretty exciting because over the last few years, the city of Ann Arbor has developed an urban forestry plan. We were excited that finding higher value uses for the wood actually made it into that plan. And so this is the next stage as we're piloting the partnerships with sawmills to make that happen. Right now, Sustainable Resources Alliance, um, which, is <laughs> which is what used to be the Southeast Michigan RC&D Council, new name, but SRA is releasing a $1,000 mini grant to help jumpstart a, another urban wood retail initiative in Michigan. So we're looking for projects that can get off the ground quickly. Um, we're really looking for something that can get started this summer. It's $1,000 in grant funding. And we'll be accepting proposals roughly through the next month. You can learn more about that at semircd.org or just get in touch with me afterwards and I'll be happy to help get you the information on it. But as part of that full circle grant that we've been talking about, um, the Urban Wood Network has developed. And so what we're seeing across all the states is that for these kind of successful projects to take place, we need to provide some help. That we see that these trees obviously have their highest value when they're living, but we want the highest and best use for them when they have to be removed. And sometimes that can be challenging because if um, a municipality is trying to remove trees and they're just worried about the risk management, they're worried about how to pay for the efforts, they're worried about how to make sure it's all cleaned up afterwards, making connections with sawmills is not their priority. And it shouldn't be, and that's okay. And so we're trying to develop stronger networks to make it easier for those kind of partnerships to take place. Um, what, like the example I gave in the city of Grand Rapids where Spalted Banjo was able to help negotiate that. We realize that not everybody has the luxury of having um, people trained in forestry who can help set up partnerships and figure out what a plan is. And so by building the Urban Wood Network, we are trying to, to bring like-minded people together to build partnerships around finding other uses for urban trees and trying to stream that, streamline that a little bit so that people can learn from each other's experiences and um, make the, the, this transition to a, a new way of dealing with wood, um, make it a little simpler on everyone. And so the Urban Wood Network is right now a joint effort between, as I said, Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, and Missouri. So those are the four states that are active partners right now. We're hoping to expand that over time. But um, basically in those states, we're really working to 
build directories of everyone who's involved with urban wood, identify partners who are willing to work with communities, communities who are willing to work with mills, woodworkers who are looking for urban lumber, architects who are looking for local sustainable products. And we're trying to, to connect all of these folks all along the supply chain um, to make the whole process a little simpler. And so right now, if you are interested in this movement, you can go to urbanwoodnetwork.org and see what, um, what our whole initiative is about. You can see what we're doing to try to bring partners together. At the moment, this is a grant funded effort. And so there is no cost to join the Urban Wood Network at this time. And we are really just trying to bring like-minded folks together around this idea and trying to, to really create some momentum. So I encourage you to check it out. If this is interesting to you at all, we're also hosting a free webinar on Tuesday, April 17th at 11 a.m. Central. It is a free webinar, but we are asking that people pre-register by April 13th, and you can do that at urbanwoodnetwork.org. But a lot of this webinar is honestly a, a little fact-finding mission for us. We'll give you a more in-depth overview of where we think the network can go and what we hope that it can offer. But we really want to hear from people like you to find out what challenges you're experiencing, where, um, where you could really use help, and what kind of services something like the Urban Wood Network could provide to really be of value to you. The way we have the Urban Wood Network organized is that while we have the overhead network that is um, really looking at the regional view, we are also really working to build our statewide networks. And so in Michigan, we have the Michigan Urban Wood Network that has just formed to specifically help Michigan partners find each other. And so you can find the Michigan Urban Wood Network at miurbanwoodnetwork.com, and we are starting to build a list there. So if you know of folks who are doing anything with Urban Wood, please encourage them to come to this website and to join us. There's a link right on there of how to join, but we're, we're simply trying to make it easier for everyone to find anyone who's doing anything with Urban Wood. And so part of that is even just mapping everyone out so that if someone has a tree removal project that's happening and they're trying to find a mill that's near them, if they need someone to help provide advice on an Urban Wood project, we're trying to pull all of that information into one place to make it easier. And so, um, right now, we're really hoping that the networks can do a couple different things. As I said, we are really trying to help people find vendors and find partners, but we're also really helping, hoping that we can help with some of the kind of bigger picture planning parts as well. So if you happen to know of a recycling organization that's interested in, um, in bringing wood into the picture, or if you are with a community and you're interested in what urban wood plans look like, or if you are just fascinated by the story and you really want to help turn a specific tree removal project into a product, get in touch. And this is something that the network can really help out with. My goals overall <laughs> for the, the rest of the year as we wind up this grant, we are going to be doing a couple of workshops to help bring people together. And so we will be launching the promotional materials for those workshops. Um, we're hoping by the end of the month, we are planning to do some um, at least one workshop that is very community focused, trying to help communities with their planning and um, help them to look out at what they need to do to line up partners and how to really communicate with the wood industry. And then we're going to be doing some, um, some events really targeting the wood industry themselves and trying to help them to increase the value of the products that, that they're producing. But we're also really hoping to pull together a lot more networking opportunities over the next year. And the Michigan DNR has been wonderfully supportive and is looking for ways that they can assist with that as well. So we are, are really trying to, like I said, build momentum and bring people together over this. But we also can provide technical assistance, as I said. So if any of this has sparked any interest for you and you have specific needs that you think um, that fall in line with any of what I've talked about, please get in touch. We want to know how we can help you. And that really wraps up everything I wanted to talk about, but I would love to answer any questions at this point. Thanks, Jessica. This is uh, always good information. Um, mostly Michigan has been known for, you know, kind of the, the sad part where all the trees are dying, but, you know, information like this, this is kind of a, you know, an impetus for people to actually get something going that's a, 
a good deal as far as using the wood and that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> I do have a one person, oh, let's see, we, Colleen says, once infested in general, how long do you have to work with the tree after it's harvested? Loggers in southern Wisconsin have been saying up to five years once infested. Yeah, I, I, think, that's, I think that's a pretty good estimate. Um, a lot of it really depends on how healthy the tree was to begin with. And so, you know, I mean, as I think most of you probably know, EAB tends to target trees that are stressed first. And so if the tree was already in decline, um, you probably don't have as long. But if the tree was otherwise healthy, you I would say up to five years um, is probably a, a, a pretty good um, is probably a pretty good estimate. One thing that's interesting is that if the wood is otherwise sound, even trees that um, even trees that have been standing dead a while can sometimes produce surprising products. And so the example that comes to mind for me in the city of Flint, they had a lot of standing dead silver maple. And um, through the urban wood programming that they were able to put together, they actually um, started doing a lot more removals. And so actually, let I'm going to give a little backstory to that in just a second. But what they found is that a lot of the standing dead trees um, were starting to rot and were getting some interesting spalding that was taking place as fungus was starting to come in. But the wood was still sound enough to produce um, to produce lumber. And but it was lumber that had interesting coloring and pattern characteristics that was really appealing to a lot of customers because of the spalding. So. Um, again, you know, keeping an open mind and keeping open communications with sawmills, um, there can be a lot of opportunity, even from trees that otherwise look pretty gnarly. Um, the uh, one thing I wanted to say about the city of Flint that's interesting, um, it's actually the conservation district that's working closely, the Gen C conservation district is working closely with the city of Flint. And they have been able to receive grants as a conservation district to help fund removals of dead and hazardous trees in the city, they're having them milled, selling the wood at the Flint Habitat for Humanity Restore, and then the profits from all of the lumber sales are then split between the conservation district, which goes right back into the city's urban forestry program, and then split with the Habitat for Humanity there. So it's a wonderful partnership, and I think an innovative one that shows how um, these kind of projects can provide very direct community benefits. Okay, um, Andy says, I would be interested in learning of some similar networking in Iowa, as far as you are. Um, he also says, I think when this was in response to what you were just talking about, would it not be best with EAB to cut the tree as soon as you identify an infestation to reduce the spread, unless you plan to treat it chemically or to save it? I I would have trouble arguing against that. <laughs> um, if you know, if you're in an area where EAB has been established, and you are not at all planning to treat those trees, I say go for it. Your your lumber quality is going to be higher. Um, those logs may be more marketable. Obviously, the other thing that I did not mention that I really, I I absolutely should. Clearly, if this wood is affected by EAB, quarantine restrictions apply. And so, um, yes, we are selling ash that was EAB affected, but in southern Michigan where <laughs> it's all open and it's all part of the same quarantine region, anything that's moving out of state or anything that would be moving up to the Upper Peninsula um, would be affected by quarantines. And, and so um, you do need to make sure that any of your producers are very aware of whatever quarantine regulations apply and that they are um, working within the standards required by the quarantine. Well, in a way, I think you might have, uh, have answered the next question pretty well. Um, what steps do you take to ensure that the pests like EAB or ALB aren't spread in the wood sold at these centers? Maybe more in a local kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a really good point. So, um, you know, the, the restrictions with EAB are, are that either the, um, the wood has to be debarked an, 
an inch, I believe it is, underneath. Um, I mean, the bark and all of the wood an inch underneath the bark needs to be removed. There we go. So live edge ash, not a good idea in uh, quarantined regions. Um, or it needs to be kiln dried to specs that I do not know off of the top of my head. <laughs> but um, but there are there are established um, established standards with APHIS that, that, that detail exactly what it has to meet in order for wood to leave a quarantined area. And so um, that is important to, to either make sure all of your products are meeting that standard or that you are communicating with your, um, your customers about what the limits are to moving any wood that does not meet those movement standards. Okay. Um... Thank you. Uh, what, um, Pam says this has been great information. I have a lot of ash in my 12 acre woods in Ohio. Is there any such program in Ohio? Oh, um, so not a coordinated effort to that I know of. However, I do know that Ohio State Extension at least um, here and there over the years has put together specific programming to help assist people. And so I don't know if Amy Stone is on here or not today, but Amy may be able to give you leads as to who in Ohio um, could be good contacts for this. Actually, I just put Amy's um, email um, on the chat. Excellent. So let's see, um, it says how, Andy says, how long do EAB live in dead wood? Hmm. This feels like one of those questions I should know the answer to, and I don't. <laughs> yeah, I, they, actually, I, from what I can recall them talking about, and some of this information you can probably find on um, the emeraldashboard.info website, but usually EAB don't, don't live in dead wood because they yeah. need phloem material to, to live, so exactly. they don't even infest dead wood. I mean, it isn't like someplace, they don't go to ash wood when it's dead. It right, doesn't interest right. them. <laughs> yep, so. they, they are only interested in living tissue. And um, I know that once the moisture content also drops below a certain threshold that I cannot remember, um, that again, they're not interested. And so, um, yeah, living EAB in Deadwood, I mean, clearly it happens because it wouldn't be transported in firewood otherwise. Right. However, um, they don't hang out there unnecessarily. That's not a very scientific answer, but <laughs> I'm sure that the, the, the actual science is out there. <laughs> um, Andy says kiln drying will kill kiln drying will kill it, but air drying not. So that kind of ties into that. Yes. Um, yeah, the air drying once it's all dried out, there's not going to yeah. be EAB live that are in there anyway. Right, the moisture um, content matters for sure. Right. Uh, uh, let's see, we have, do you have much experience using smaller trees? A lot of the trees being preemptively removed in Colorado communities are small diameter. What uses have you found for these trees? Yeah, um, that's harder for sure. Um, fence posts are, are a good one. Um, and specifically the pine removal project that the Land Conservancy of West Michigan worked on, they were all fairly small diameter trees. And so they ended up doing fence posts with them. That one is harder. Um, now, it's not saying that people can't do creative things. There is a fabulous company out of Chicago called Icon Modern. They literally create some of the most beauti beautiful side tables that I've ever seen from buckthorn removals. I mean, so they're, I mean, they're literally using like shrubs, um, sapling level wood and using adhesives to create um, to, as a binding agent to, to actually create solid wood furniture from um, extremely small diameter stuff. So I, I guess my advice is, you know, the sky's the limit if you have producers who are willing to be really creative. Okay. Um, Amy has answered. She says, the Ohio Woodland Stewards Program with the School of Environment and Natural Resources at Ohio State would be a good resource regarding ash utilization in Ohio. The website is www.woodlandstewards.osu.edu. So <clears throat> there you have that. 
Um, Thanks, Andy. And Andy does want to know how long after you cut an infested tree as far as the, <clears throat> the drying out, I'm going to assume. Um, I think that that answer to that is it, it, it depends. Yeah. Um, how large the tree is, how heavily it's infested. Um, there's a lot of different um, parameters as far as how long after you cut an ash tree, the air drying will that the EAB will leave those, um, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me. So yeah, and that's. The thing that's tough about that too, is that um, this really gets, this gets into bigger questions of log quality as suitability for products. So typically speaking, when you have removed a tree, you don't want a log to sit forever before it's milled because as it starts, to lose moisture content, the, um, the actual lumber quality decreases because you can have a lot of irregular um, movement in the wood that happens as the moisture leaves the log. And so in the, in the forest products industry, they, I mean, people try a lot of different things. They will wax or paint the, the ends, the open ends of logs, or some people even submerge logs. I've, you know, in tanks of water, I and mean, people do all sorts of different things to try to actually slow the drying out of the log until it can be until it can be processed. And so, you know, these are all kind of competing factors <laughs> that happen um, on one hand, where you're trying to reduce the moisture content in order to make it less habitable for something like EAB, but at the same time, you're trying to control how the moisture content drops to um, increase the value of the eventual products, or the potential value of the products, I should say. And so, you know, there are challenges with this, but the thing I will say overall, we have, I, and I'm not saying this is, um, this is the situation everyone will find, we have had the most luck in Michigan with urban trees, um, working with very small producers who are flexible, who um, are willing to take non-standard material, who are willing to take small quantities of material. And um, so we've had the most luck with like the small family owned businesses that own a wood miser, that sort of thing, rather than large established, highly mechanized operations that are far less interested in urban logs for a lot of reasons. And so um, what we found through that though, is that the small businesses are also willing to take logs that might not meet the standards of some of the larger, more traditional industry as well. And so the biggest, most important thing is to find potential partners and start a conversation with them about what specifically they are looking for. Because I can tell you all day about what certain partners in Michigan are looking for, but that may not be true of particular partners in your region because it really depends on what their markets are. And so um, there's a lot of variation and a lot of, um, but that also means there's a lot of opportunity. And so it's important to just reach out and start talking with folks and finding out what they might be willing to accept because that, um, that's, where, that's where you're gonna find opportunity for sure. And the, the other thing that I didn't mention really quickly is that, Think beyond EAB because we jump started all of these projects as a response to EAB and the just flood of removals that we had all at once because of EAB. But the sustainability of the programming over time has really happened when we realized that EAB was not the be all end all of our urban wood waste problem and that by having a willingness to look at other species and um, recognizing the opportunity in the bigger body of all of the wood that we remove for lots of reasons, that that's how, we're, how we can create and support businesses that are able to continue over time. EAB is great because it kind of captures the public imagination. You can get a lot of news stories around it. You can get a lot of recognition for it, but don't stop there. That sounds good. Um, Andy also says uh, removing bark ASAP will make the tree less suitable for any remaining EAB. Is that right? But will also perhaps render it less valuable as lumber. And um, Vince responds, it depends on when the tree was cut. Potentially, if a tree is cut in the fall or winter, EAB could still emerge from it the following spring. Yes. However, the risk is extremely low that EAB 
EAB will infest a, a log again after that, which is, yes, this is true. Any, yep. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Jess? That's a great point on the seasonal timing. That is a really great point that, um, you know, that point of when eggs have been laid and emergence takes place is, is really key to all of this. And so that's why I, I encourage you, rather than just taking your advice on meeting, um, uh, meeting phytosanitary requirements. Don't take that from me. Talk to an APHIS, um, an APHIS representative for the specifics, and that's where to really get the cutting edge information on what you need to know. And mo a lot of that information is on the emerald-ashbore.info site. If you look, if you get on the search function and you want, if, and put your state in there, and it will come up with some a lot of that information as well. So um, yes, APHIS is always a good. A good uh, resource there. Okay, let's see. Indiana's requirement of for material is to be to be re. Okay, let me start that again. Indiana's requirement for material to be deregulated is removing the bark and a half an inch of the sapwood. Which that sounds. That's I think that's kind of what um, is has been the has been kind of the general rule. So thank you for providing that information. Yeah, thank you. With that. All right. Um, I don't see any more questions, but you've got your email address there. So um, everyone, um, you know how to get a hold of Jessica. And again, Jessica, this has been great. We always learn good information from you, um, having you on our webinars, because it's, uh, it's you know, t trees are going to continue to die. There's always something <laughs> that's going to be affecting them. So.